Hello everyone, Panzer J back with a new video. This one is going to be on um, Axis and Allies, uh, Global 1940. Haven't played this particular game in quite a while. Um, I've been mostly playing Historical Board Gaming's uh, Global Wars 36 and 39. And then uh, the version 3 map for Global War 36 should be here any day now. I pre-ordered that, so... I'm sure a lot of my time will be uh, devoted to that to that game. I kind of got away from um, the Saxon Allies 1940 um, just because I find the 39 and 36 games to be um, more in depth. Obviously, they start um, earlier, um, one pre-war and the other a year earlier in the war itself. So there's more options. Um, more countries involved. Each country has um, some sp cool uh, specialized units, like the Germans have the Waffen SS, the Russians have Russian Guard units, um, the U.S. has Marines, uh, the British have Commandos, and so forth. So I think that adds a really cool uh, flavor to the game. And again, with it starting earlier, um, you have a lot more options. Um, really for each country in terms of where you can go and um, how the conflict will unfold. But having said that, um, Axe and Allies 1940 is a very cool game. Um, this came out before the other two, so I had been playing this for quite a while and had a lot of fun with it. And it still holds up. It's still um, a very playable game. So I kind of wanted to go back and revisit um, Global 40, kind of reacquire a taste for it, so to speak. So I've been getting on YouTube and going ahead and watching a bunch of uh, strategy videos that are out, and there's a bunch of them. Um, a bunch of guys do some really good work um, with the Global 40 videos. So this video isn't necessarily a strategy video. I just kind of um, took a little bit of what I saw on some of those videos and some of my own ideas, and I just wanted to kind of go through um, some thoughts I had, some of the things that I saw that I liked in the videos, and then some things um, that I would do differently myself. Um, one thing, and I'm not big on house rules um, for, for games. I like kind of sticking with um, the rules the game actually comes with that the, the, the manufacturers of the game, um, have in place already. Not that house rules can't be cool and, um, add some flavor to the game. And definitely nothing against those that, um, do implement their own house rules. But I'm more of a, you know, play by the, the, the rule book kind of guy. And one thing that I see a lot in um, some of the videos that are out there is I see the Allies uh, invading countries like uh, Spain, Portugal, uh, even Turkey over in the Mideast. And that is definitely something you can do in this game. There is not a, a rule against it. Um, basically, if either side, whether it's an Axis power or an Allied power, invade a strict neutral, which, as you can see, Spain and Portugal both are. Uh, the other types of neutrals are Yugoslavia is an example of a pro-Allied, and it says it um, underneath Yugoslavia, or Bulgaria is a pro-Axis. So in the case of a pro-neutral uh, country, all that um, power has to do is um, place a unit in there and that activates that power for that side. So obviously for Yugoslavia, any allied um, country could go there and activate Yugoslavia and the same thing for, for, for Bulgaria on the Axis side. But with the strict neutrals, they don't lean either way. So if you go into a strict neutral you have to fight whatever the standing army is, which in the case of Spain would be six infantry units. 
And then once you do that, assuming you take Spain, you now control Spain and the $2 that, um, that Spain produces. The only negative effect to that in this game is that the rest of the strict neutrals, which again, if we're using Spain as an example that we're taking Spain, then Portugal, um, Turkey, um, Sweden, they would all then become pro to the um, other side. So if, for example, and again, I've seen this in a bunch of videos, if the United States were to invade Spain, then all the other strict neutrals would then become pro-Axis. So Germany or Italy would just have to uh, place a unit in that country and that would activate that country for um, the Axis powers. So there is a negative consequence to invading a strict neutral. My only issue with that is the Allies um, are theoretically the good guys in this war. And the idea of them invading a strict neutral country um, is, to, in my mind, completely unrealistic. Um, I know Churchill did have designs on Norway in 1940 before the Germans got there. Um, but in the case of this game, it's a full-on invasion. If you go into that country, you're completely wiping out their army. Um, and that's just not something I think the Allies would have done under almost any circumstances. Obviously, if it was something completely vital to the war, maybe. But public opinion... Um, not just in that home country, but around the globe. I mean, here you are um, fighting a crusade to liberate Europe and um, you're campaigning against German aggression and how um, the Axis are invading all these neutral, peaceful countries and then you turn around and invade Spain. I just, I just don't think that would be... I just don't think that would have happened. I just don't think it's very realistic. So... The thing I've been kind of kicking around is there's got to be more of a deterrent um, to that than just simply the rest of the strict neutrals now become pro, you know, access. So I've been uh, thinking about, well, what could possibly be some negative consequences for the Allies if they did invade a neutral, a strict neutral country like that? Well, maybe, obviously, world opinion maybe would uh, be against such a move. Maybe that would result in um, recruitment to the Axis cause in, you know, other countries. Maybe um, public opinion in some of the, um, not just the neutral countries, but some of even the countries that were already involved in the conflict, maybe that would arouse um, resentment towards the Allies. So I've been kind of thinking about, well, what happens if, so the U.S. comes into Spain so now the rest of the strict neutrals become pro axis like in the rule book. But then what if you give Germany, let's say, uh, five free infantry units to place in the country adjacent to um, the strict neutral that was just invaded by the Allies? And that could kind of be um, a result of, again, um, public opinion swinging against the Allies for that move. And now... Um, Germany sees a boost in recruitment to their cause, maybe. Um, kind of like when Germany invaded the Soviet Union. Um, several countries, not just Eastern European, but Western European, um, there were a bunch of volunteers um, to the Waffen-SS to fight in Russia. So I've been kind of kicking around that idea as just maybe a further deterrent to um, the Allies um, invading strict neutrals. Um, you might expect that from the Axis, the bad guys in this conflict, but you really wouldn't expect the uh, United States to be invading. And Spain, obviously Franco, definitely had leaning towards the Axis, and the Spanish Blue Division did fight on the Russian front, but that was strictly in Russia. There was no um, conflict between Spain and the Western allies at all. Um, but even if you could somehow you know, come up with a scenario where Spain would have been invaded. I mean, Portugal, <laughs> I mean, there's basically not even a chance, that any chance whatsoever that the United States would have invaded Portugal. And again, I see that a bunch in, um, in some of these videos. So I just think that's completely unrealistic. And I would, um, 
if not outright, um, ban that kind of move. At the very least, um, give enough incentive to the U.S. not to do something like that by, you know, negative consequences. So besides um, the countries going, the rest of the neutrals going pro access, maybe, like I said, throw in um, some free infantry as kind of like a recruitment um, deal for Germany. And I would again place that on, I'm assuming at this point, Germany is controlling these French territories, Southern France and Normandy, Bordeaux. So maybe, um, as soon as the U S invades Spain, um, on Germany's next turn, they're able to place, um, I was thinking the number five sounds decent, five free infantry units in, um, a bordering territory. So that's something I've been thinking about. So I might be implementing that in, uh, in this current game that I'm going to be starting here soon. Um, other than that, um, the strategy videos that are out there are very informative. Um, give you a good idea what to do. Um, that is only one other reason why I kind of shied away from this game is it becomes, I think, um, maybe because of the fact that we're in 1940. So the conflict is already pretty much set as far as who's at war with who. Um, at least um, Italy is already at war with the Western powers. Um, the game comes to a, becomes to a certain extent um, um, repetitive, and um, you can kind of see what's coming. I mean, okay, does Japan attack on turn one? Do they do a J1 attack? Um, the U.S. throws all their build um, in the... Eastern United States, uh, Britain does a Taranto raid and takes out the Italian fleet. Now Italy is pretty much crippled for the entire game and we're only a turn into it. I mean, they only start the game with 10 income to begin with. So, I mean, they're not, they don't have much economic power. And now you take out, you know, half their Navy, including their only battleship. And, you know, Italy's not much of a force in the game. So that was, that's only my really big, um, not necessarily complaint, but about the game is just that, like I said, it becomes um, kind of repetitive in terms of what you do. I mean, there's not too much um, deviation from what most people do, at least experienced players. Whereas in something like Global 39, for instance, um, you know, Italy's not at war with the Western powers. Japan has sneak attacks, so you don't know. Um, there, so there's definitely a question of, okay, when Japan's going to attack, where they're going to attack, um, where they're going to use their sneak attacks. Germany's got the Blitzkrieg, so on one turn, they're going to go, uh, in essence, two turns in one round. So, um, And also, I think it's harder for, or not necessarily harder, but it takes longer for the Russians and the United States to get into the war in, in 39, because um, we're you're die rolling. Which I mean, there are events that like give them increased um, income, but for the most part, unless uh, the United States is rolling ridiculous, um, you can keep the U.S. out of the war a little bit longer and do a few more things with Japan. But had, with that being said, again, uh, Global Forty is still a really cool game, so I'm going to revisit that, um, play uh, an entire game here. And just try to do a few different things, maybe some things that I haven't seen done before, just to, you know, just to see how things work out. Um, for Germany, for instance, um, on the first turn here, which I'm going to be starting soon enough, I plan on buying a major factory. Germany starts out with 30 bucks, and that's what a major factory is going to cost me. So I'm not going to be able to purchase any units, just the major factory. And that's going to be put down into Romania. Um, at the end of turn one, and that's because I plan on invading Russia on turn two, and I want um, a complex, a major complex, um, right down there on the border with the Soviet Union. So that's where I'm going to spend my $30 is Germany. Uh, besides that, some of the other stuff is going to be pretty much um, familiar. Going to go into uh, Finland up north, activate Finland, the four men and the $2 there. Come down into Bulgaria, um, activate that country, get the dollar and the four men for Bulgaria. Um, we're going to 
do some naval combat in the Atlantic. Again, do things a little bit differently. Um, this cruiser down here in C091, this British cruiser, I see that left alone quite a bit. But I'm going to bring the sub from 103 and 108 down and uh, try to take out that cruiser. And I'm going to do that because I don't want that cruiser to be able to come into the med on the, on the United Kingdom's turn and participate in taking out um, the Italian ships. So I want to kind of protect Italy as much as I can. Two subs against a cruiser, probably about a 50-50 proposition, so hopefully I'll get lucky there. But I want to take that out, because if you don't take that cruiser out, um, pretty much nine times out of ten in the videos I've watched, that cruiser is going to come into the med, and you're going to be able to, as the British with that cruiser, along with the other units the British have, you're going to be able to probably take out this destroyer and transport and do the Taranto raid and take out the battleship, destroyer, and cruiser there. So you'll pretty much cripple Italy. So hopefully if I can take out that cruiser, um, maybe the British now can only go after um, one sea zone worth of ships, and that would help out Italy tremendously. Then, but obviously by taking those two subs down, now you're taking them out of position for some of the other um, sea battles in the Atlantic. So over here, I'm just going to bring this one sub over from 117 and take on this uh, destroyer and transport. And again, that's going to be about a 50-50 proposition. The transport won't be involved in the combat itself, but you got a sub against a destroyer. Um, and that's the chance I'm taking by not bringing over the sub in 108. Then um, up in the North Atlantic, you're going to bring this sub from 118 and this sub from 124, and we're going to come down into this sea zone and take on those British ships, and then obviously the German battleship will come over and a bunch of German planes as well. So those are the sea battles um, I expect uh, to fight. So we're going to, again, we're going to probably leave this battleship and this cruiser alone. I don't really see how um, Germany can take them out as well. I mean, I suppose I could use air power um, alone to try to take out those um, British ships. You always have the possibility that the British could um, scramble the two fighters that are there. So, But if you bring enough air power over, maybe that would dissuade the British. They wouldn't want to really chance losing both of those fighters on uh, Germany's first round of combat. That would open them up to maybe Sea Lion on turn two, but then again, I'm not purchasing any um, German ships, so Sea Lion really isn't uh, isn't going to be realistic. Um, but it's the price I'm going to have to pay to put that major complex by in Romania to uh, invade Russia on turn two. Other than that, obviously, you got to go after France. So I'm going to be coming into Paris with as much as I can bring. Um, Paris absolutely has to fall on turn one. That's a given. Um, I mean, if, if Paris is still standing after Germany's round one, um, it's not an overstatement to say that the game's probably over for Germany just um, after one round of, of uh, play. I mean, there's no way you can keep France alive, collecting income, um, and producing units, not to mention that as Germany, you're not going to be able to collect the $19 that France starts the game with. So, And that in turn will obviously put you behind what you can purchase on turn two. So definitely going into Paris. Um, I also usually, as Germany, I don't see this done all the time. I mean, I know it kind of strips Germany of um, units by pu pushing everything west on turn one. But I also like to not only take uh, Normandy, Bordeaux, but also southern France as well. I've seen a bunch of videos where um, players will leave, the German player will leave southern France for Italy to take which would be good as far as a boost to Italy's income. But I like to take all three French territories as the Germans on turn one. Um, I think the key to an Axis victory in this game is Germany being as strong as possible. Um, not only are they fending off the British to a certain extent, um, at least in the Atlantic, if not possibly a British invasion of Western Europe, but then you've got... Uh, the Eastern Front, Russia you're dealing with, and more likely than not, the United States is probably um, going to be coming over 
sooner maybe rather than later. So Germany's got a lot to deal with. So for me, a key to an Axis victory in this game is a Germany that's as strong as possible. So I want them to take as much French territory on turn one as they can. So I usually go ahead and bring these tanks down a couple of through northern Italy down into southern France. Um, some planes obviously go into Paris with the Max and the infantry that are on the border there from western Germany. Go into Normandy, Bordeaux over here with you've got German tanks and infantry there. So I usually try to take all three of those territories. Now obviously spreading myself out a little bit thinner like that. Um, leaves Germany uh, the chance of not being able to take um, something because I, I haven't moved as much enough in there to take all three of them, but I like to take that chance. And if you do end up taking all three of those uh, territories, even if you don't have many units left, um, obviously France is completely wiped out in, in Europe, and the British, they do have a transporter, maybe two, but uh, more than likely just a single transport, so they're not going to be able to land back in Europe before your uh, next turn, and you can start building some units back up in Western Europe anyways. And then over here in the east, um, I'm holding off actually attacking Russia on turn one, but I'm going to go ahead and start bringing um, this huge stack of men in Berlin. They're going to go over one spot to be on the border with Russia, the artillery, um, some of these other... Uh, artillery and men start moving over all going over the once the one space that they can move to either be on the border with Russia or at the very least be just one um, territory closer because I'm invading Russia on turn two I don't want to give Russia any more of a chance to um, to build up units um, start throwing things at the border to make it that much harder. I mean, if you look right now, um, obviously we don't know exactly what Russia is going to do um, on their turn, but they've got two, four, seven men on the border with Germany right now. Uh, three men in the Baltic states, two in eastern Poland, and two in Bessarabia. So not a lot. Um, up in here in Finland, I'll be up on the border with Finland with the three men from Norway, as well as the four activated Finland infantry. So I'll be on the border um, in northern Russia with seven infantry. And again, I'll have my major factory down in Romania that will be able to produce 10 units um, right on turn two. And that'll probably be all mechanized, a combination of tanks and mechanized infantry to not only give my to give my uh, invasion some more offensive punch, but also to um, have some fast units that can move a couple of uh, turns, a couple of uh, uh, territories per turn. So I don't think by evading Russia on turn two, um, I'm not going to give them um, as much time to collect the income and, and to uh, build up their defenses. I mean, if you, again, if you look at income wise, Russia starts the game with $37. So this isn't global war 39 where Russia starts with like $6 or $8, something like that. Um, they have substantial income right, right from the start. So if you're delaying the German invasion by several turns, I mean, two turns, that's what $74. Um, three turns, um, $111. So I don't want Russia to collect anywhere near that much money before I invade them. I want to start taking those territories and start taking that money away um, as soon as I can. I think that's a key um, to um, a successful German invasion of Russia and um, put me closer to Moscow um, earlier in the game. So that's what I plan on doing is Germany. Um, I'll be back with a video at the completion of um, a completion of the round. I'm going to play a complete round of combat and we'll see how things went. And we'll talk about some of the uh, reactions for the other countries. Um, talking about Japan real quick. They're the other big... Um, Power that kind of determines the pace of the game. Um, 
the Axis need to be on the offensive early. Um, and that applies to Japan just as much as Germany. So for the Japanese, I see a lot of people doing a J1 attack, which means um, at the start of the game, Japan's only at war with China. As you can see, they've got substantial um, ground and air units in on the Chinese mainland. So they only start out the game at war with China. Um, but a lot of people go ahead and do a J1 attack, which means they're bringing the Western Allies in right on turn one. So they're going to come down here, maybe take the Philippines, um, take out this uh, Far East Command battleship off Malaya, um, maybe go ahead and invade the Hawaiian Islands, or at least take out the U.S. fleet there. Start coming down here and landing in the Money Islands, Java, Sumatra, Borneo, Celebes. Maybe come down here and take um, Hong Kong from the Far East Command. So, and that there's definitely a lot to be said for that. Um, but I usually do a J2 attack if there's such a thing. I wait till a second turn. So, what I'm planning on doing is Japan is I want to build, they start the game with $26. So I want to build um, probably a couple of transports and a minor complex. The minor complex I'm going to place somewhere, haven't decided yet, somewhere on the Chinese mainland so I can start producing three units per turn in China so I don't have to uh, tie up my transports ferrying uh, troops over from Japan itself. And then with a couple of Japanese transports, um, I'm going to be moving some men around from this big stack that's in Japan at the start of the game. So we're going to go ahead and just um, push into China as much as possible on turn one. There's a few territories you can see up here in northern China that are completely um, undefended. So we're going to take those, no issue. And then we're going to come down, take Hunan, um, maybe take this territory right here. So probably about three to four Chinese territories should fall on turn one for Japan. And then besides that, like I said, I'm going to stay away from bringing the uh, Western allies into the conflict on turn one. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to kind of spread out some of the Japanese fleet. You got a little bit of a fleet down here in the Carolines, a destroyer, a fully loaded carrier. You got a transport and a cruiser off Formosa, off of Okinawa. We got a battleship, a sub, a destroyer, and a transport. And then in the Japanese home waters, we got a bunch of um, air and naval units. A couple fully loaded carriers, a couple of destroyers, a battleship, a sub, a transport, and a cruiser. And then a bunch of planes that are both um, on carriers as well as in Japan itself. So what I'm going to be doing is I want to position um, as much of this Japanese Navy around the Pacific to strike at a bunch of different targets on turn two. Um, if you look right now, um, not all of the ships are as spread out as I'd want them to be. Like obviously in Japan itself, you've got most of the Japanese Navy. So I kind of want to spread the Navy out a little bit in several different directions so that on turn two, um, I've done a couple things. One, I've positioned myself to strike the Allies at a bunch of different places. They don't know exactly where I'm going to be going. Um, and also to gobble up as much income and territory as possible. So I'm going to bring down um, some transports and some ships down in the South Pacific. I can come down to the Philippines. I can start grabbing the Money Islands. Um, maybe push into some of the Far East Command territories. I'm going to bring a fleet over closer to Hawaii so that Hawaii is um, could be um, struck on turn two. I'm also going to go ahead and bring some uh, transports with some men, um, ships, up into the North Pacific here to threaten Alaska. So now on turn two, going into turn two, the United States has to worry about possibly an Alaskan invasion and a Hawaii invasion. So the U.S. might not necessarily be spending hardly anything in the eastern United States, which is what I want, because I don't want um, the U.S. to start piling up there to gang up on Germany that early in the war. 
So that's going to kind of be a Japanese strategy. We'll see how that plays out along with the German strategy, and we'll see you in the next video.